and birds can breathe again. Pass the word around, floats all down. Christ is able to make us one. At his table he set the tone, teaching people to live to the last. Love in word and indeed express. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again. Pass the word around, floats all down. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again. Pass the word around, floats all down. Jesus calls us in, calls us out, bearing fruit in a world of doubt. Gives us love to tell, bread to share, God Emmanuel everywhere. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again. Pass the word around, floats all down. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again. Pass the word around, floats all down. Jesus lives again. Good morning, friends, and welcome. Welcome to this joint worship service of Hillside Community Church and Sanctuary United Church of Christ. Yes, it's true. We are two congregations, but we share one single mission. We are on a mission to love God and to love people because we believe that love changes everything. So whoever you are, wherever you are, however you are at this moment in time, whatever you have done in the course of this week or the course of your life, you are welcome here. Uh, I, it looks like, do we have any kids today? I don't know. But if you have your candles, I'm going to invite you to, to grab them, pull them out. And I'm going to ask the question that we ask at the beginning of every worship service. And adults, I'm going to ask you invite you really to into an act of bravery uh if you know why we light this candle at the beginning of every worship service i want you to unmute and shout out your answer or if you don't know just sit there quietly because me... jesus is the light of the world jesus yes. is the light of the world yes and he loves us yes we're getting out from all quarters yes jesus is the light of the world and he loves us and to remember that and to symbolize that at the beginning of every worship, we light our candles. So friends, at the count of, of three, I'm going to invite you to uh, put your clickers up to your candles and let there be light. One, two, three. Amen. Amen, friends. Uh, so now we're going to hear one of our, our favorite messy church songs, Rain Down. all about God's abundant love which just showers down over us like rain so let's make it rain rain down rain down rain down your love on your people rain down rain down rain down your love God of love
Good morning, Peggy Sue. Freddie, I am so excited to see you out in the garden. It looks like you're having a great time and like maybe you're all on a couch. That's amazing. That's fantastic. I wish I had a couch in the garden. And Peggy Sue, it is very nice to see you as well. Okay, so we're going to do something a little bit different today, you guys. Um, today, we, your three pastors, are going to each talk about some tough subjects. You know, some things that are kind of hard to talk about, that sometimes we get a little scared to talk about because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, right? And it's scary, but pretty important. And maybe sometimes it can even be a little fun. So I'm thinking, I was thinking about this and I was thinking, what's something that is a little scary, but is also kind of fun. And I was immediately thinking about skydiving. You've been skydiving before, right, Freddie? Yeah, definitely skydiving sometimes. Pretty fun. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I hear you. I get you. Um, and Peggy Sue, too, you've been, oh, wait, have you guys never been skydiving? No? Never? Okay, well, using the power of our, um, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm going to present you with a very exciting opportunity today. Um, your pastor, Tom, and I have uh, created an interactive experience. Uh, it is a skydiving sim simulation. And what is the most important thing to know about skydiving? It's scary. It's scary, right? Uh, and when should you not skydive? It has when, to, uh huh. In the winter. In winter. In the winter, that's a good idea. Um, <laughs> but what do you really need to go skydiving? It starts with a P. It rhymes with parachute. A parachute! Or in this case, you need a device that we are calling poly parachute. So, uh, Freddie, would you be willing to be our experimental first ever? Rider on our friend Polly Parachute. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. 
So guys, when Freddie, Freddie is going to, um, I'm sorry, mom and dad, could you guys just shrink Freddie real fast? Just like use your shrink ray powers and shrink him down to like the size of an iPhone. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, tiny Freddie, just hop right on here. Are you in all safe and sound? I'm in. I'm you're in. Yeah, you're strapped in. You ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Now, on the count of three, I am going to. We're gonna go for a ride, okay? But Pastor Tom is over there and he is definitely going to catch you. Do you trust Pastor Tom? Do you trust Pastor Tom? Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay, all right, me too. I gotta take my, oh, wait, do I have to take my headphones off? Oh no, okay. All uh, right, okay, good. <laughs> all right, ready? Now everybody count off with me, all right? And a one, a two, a three. Yeah. All right. Okay. Woo. How was that, Freddie? How was it? Good. It's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. Okay. Now, is there anybody else who maybe wants to go for a ride on Polly Parachute? No? Anybody else? Uh, does anybody, no, we, we feeling good? Oh, oh my God, I see Peggy Sue down there. Peggy Sue, did you want to try to, oh, you don't want to. No? I'm scared of heights. You're scared of heights? Well then, you definitely don't have to ride on Polly Parachute. If it sounds too scary, you don't have to do it. That's totally cool. And in fact, and in fact, actually, I have a special song for Peggy Sue that we should sing real fast, just to make sure that she knows whenever she's doing something scary, we got her back. Okay, I'm gonna teach it to you guys real fast, okay? It goes like this. Hey, Peggy Sue. I want you to know that we got you. Okay, so it's a really simple song, right? So whenever Peggy Sue is feeling scared, what are we gonna do? Hey, Peggy Sue, we want you to know that we got you. Simple, simple solution. Just a, just a quick incantation. Um, do we have time for another person to ride on a poly parachute or do we, are we feeling pretty good? I think we need to get one more rider on here. Yeah, let's, let's make sure that uh, Pastor Tom's hand-eye coordination is up to snuff today, you know what I mean? Um, so let's see. And I, I think that this time I'd like to combine uh, our two methods of, uh, you know, making sure that we all trust in our community or rather just reminding each other that we got each other's backs. So who wants to, who wants to volunteer? Who feels confident in their abilities to shrink to the size of an iPhone and take, take a little ride? Jerry, what do you think, Jerry? Aaron Olapade? What do you think, Aaron Olapade? What do you, you want to volunteer? All right, AJ's in. Okay. Um, let's see. How do we how do we make this uh, how do we make this rhyme for Aaron over here? Uh, hey, hey. You know, what, let's just uh, let's give Aaron a little ride, and uh, then later I'll tell him about the song we made for him. So, Aaron, you're gonna climb into this iPhone. You cool with that? Yeah. Okay. You're gonna climb into this iPhone whose name is Polly Parachute. And I am going to launch you across the room and Tom is gonna to catch you because we got your back. Into it? Okay, ready? One, two, three. Ah! There we go. 
Aaron, you're muted. Sorry, that was great. How did that, that feel? Ride. Did that feel good? Okay. I did. Thank you. I, I like the accountability for you both. <laughs> so, not all songs do rhyme, Stephanie. You're completely correct. So yeah, hey, Aaron Olapade. I want you to know that we got your back and we got you, we got you, buddy. All right, friends, we're gonna have some tough conversations today, but we want you to know that anything that we bring up can, you can talk to your parents about it. You can talk to your teachers about it. You could even talk to your ministers about it. They would probably be pretty happy to chat with you. And that goes for all the kids who are on this call today. Kate Eshelman, Lisa Parker, Peggy Sue, Freddie, Mary and Jerry, all the kids on the call. So friends, uh, without further ado, we're gonna have a little song, a little communion. <laughs> Something's coming next. <laughs> and so friends, it is time for that special meal that we love to celebrate together where we eat bread that reminds us that God loves us, and we drink juice that reminds us that God is with us no matter what. And we like to remember those things by telling the story about how, on the night before he died, Jesus was sitting at table with his friends. And he took bread, and after he had given thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his friends, saying, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you do this, he said, remember me. And in the same manner, after they had finished eating, Jesus took a cup, and after giving God thanks, he gave it to the disciples, saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for one and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, he said, Remember me. And so, friends, I need you to, to warm up your blessing hands. Get them nice and warm, ready to let the love flow out of your body, out of your hands, and over your elements as I pray, saying, Gentle Redeemer, there is no lockdown on your blessing and no quarantine on your grace. Send your spirit of life and love, power and blessing upon every table where your, chilter, your children shelter in place. That this bread may be broken and gathered in love, and that this cup poured out to give hope to all. Risen Christ, breathe in us that we may breathe in you. Live in us that we may live in you. Amen. And now, friends, let us in our many places receive the gift of God, the bread of heaven. For we are one in Christ in the bread that we share. And let us in our many places receive the gift of God, the cup of blessing. We are one in Christ in the cup we share. Would the beloved community of God's people all say amen? Amen. I've got a place at the welcome table. I've got a place at the welcome table. Some of these days. Hallelujah. I've got a place at the welcome table. I've got a place at the welcome table. Some of these days. What's that going to do? God's going to set this world on fire. God's going to set this world on fire. Some of these days. Hallelujah. God's going to set this world on fire. Set this world on fire some of these days. I'll 
This morning comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I invite you to listen for the word of God and these words of scripture. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Here ends our reading. May we be blessed with understanding. So friends, if you received this week's e-newsletter, then you know that today, in lieu of a regular sermon, the three of us, Wendy, John, and I, are going to take on nine controversial topics in two minutes or less each. Now, why are we doing this? We are doing this because, as Paul reminds us, by speaking the truth in love, we grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. That is to say, there is no topic that, if approached with enough love, cannot help us grow together as a community. Each topic we're about to take up was submitted from our media and online community. Uh, and to be sure, each deserves reflection, study, and thoughtful consideration. And each has been debated by any number of scholars, scientists, theologians, philosophers, and of course, authors. There have been mountains of research, data, scholarship, sermons written on all of these subjects. So we want to begin today just by acknowledging that. Uh, but we want to now invite you to sit back and consider our quick takes as simply that, a taste of what, what might be said about these controversial topics. It will not be enough for sure, 
but it might just get your juices flowing. It certainly did ours. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Wendy with our first quick take. Uh, testing, testing, you hear me okay? Great. Well, perhaps you know the native wisdom about the two wolves of our human nature struggling for control. The first is the wolf of peace, love, and kindness. The other is the wolf of fear, greed, and hatred. Which wolf will win, asks the young one of the wise elder, Whichever one you feed, of course, is the answer. We intuitively know the harm holding hate has on our spirits, our bodies, and our society. The Buddha says holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal with the intention of throwing it at another, but we're the ones that get burned. We know that it is not good for us uh, to go and go to great lengths to teach our children even to not use the word hate. A few moments cruising social media, whichever bubble that you are a part of, will uh, allow you to know that we are in trouble as a society from all of the hate that gets passed around. And I'm just going to pause here for a second because my, um, my functionality is moving too slowly. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, try to fix that quickly. Uh, for, if you'll just forgive me for just a minute, um, or maybe I'll just get rid of that and go back to the, um, hold on just a second, Tom. I'm so sorry about this because I need to be moving and I promised two minutes and that's going to be way longer than it needs to be at that, at that level. So... <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's always something with you, Wendy. <sighs> Dead air. <laughs> oh, I thought I had everything ready. Oh, I love this. I love this work. Yeah. Oh, thank you for singing that song for me. Okay, where am I? Um, yet the Hebrew Bible tells us that there is both a time for love and a time for hate. So are there times, in fact, when hate is helpful? Well, Jesus is absolute about one thing. Love all of your neighbors as yourself. And oh, by the way, forgive your enemies seven times, 77 times. So it seems clear that love, not hate, is the only appropriate way to relate to God's beloved children, the rest of creation, including the earth and yourself. But the psalmist sings, let those who love the Lord hate evil. And Amos offered these words of inspiration to Israel, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. So it would seem that the consequence of a passion for a more just, healthy, and harmonious world would lead us to disdain, if not hate, injustice, bigotry, racism, casteism, inequity, policies that protect white supremacy. You get the idea. If we love rightly, we will inevitably recognize that there is indeed a time to, or perhaps I should say systems to hate. So, you know, when you asked us this question, to me, the answer seemed relatively simple. Encasing God within one gender is, uh, as the poet once wrote, Wicked silly. The history behind this, behind this realization is poignant, is devastating, and it is too long for this sermon. But what I wanna say is that we in this community, we articulate it ready, uh, readily, we articulate it often. For our denomination, in fact, God is still speaking, right? Which is also to say that God is constantly making God's self known, even through our language. This is why we often begin sermons with a prayer 
that the words which often we have already written be acceptable unto you. In other words, even pronouns are a name of God. And whether that name be Allah or Adonai or Brahma or Quetzalcoatl or even Lord Flying Spaghetti Monster, I want to be sure that every time those names are something that resonates with me and resonates among this community. But, you know, in thinking about this, I got curious, right? You know, uh, what might it be like to belong to a tradition with a long and unapologetic history of masculine language for God in its liturgy? Roman Catholicism. Which is why, friends, it pays to have friends. So I talked to two friends of mine who similarly believe that the gender of God is not as simple as I am he who is called I am, but who are also Roman Catholic. So my friend, Brother Anthony, he's a Capuchin Franciscan friar who leads a street ministry every Wednesday and Saturday, offering hospitality to folks on the street. When he prays with his brothers, he says that the masculine pronouns used for God echo in the bodies of the men gathered around him, that the peace of Christ may aid them in their works of mercy, but also their works of liberation, a liberation that involves the dismantling of patriarchy. Or my friend Julia, who finds simple and subtle resistance in staying silent as the mass veers into exclusively male God talk, who knows that as much as it is the Vatican, her tradition is also about the lay Catholic women who lead prayer meetings, who direct choirs, and who keep the churches singing. And you know, guys, I'm so grateful to know that my sisters in Christ have a place in this church that is not determined solely by their gender, but by the needs of their soul. And I am glad to know you all in the peace of God within this community. But outside here, for our sisters, for our gender fluid kin who make up the body of Christ in the Catholic Church and other denominations that continue to use masculine language, I want to offer a prayer that in your silence, we may hear your resistance, that you may always find in your soul the image of God. As good red-blooded Americans, we have what is at this moment an almost limitless right to buy and to own guns. So the face question for us in regards to the topic of guns is, should we as Christians support policies that restrict that right? Or to put it another way, should we support policies that hinder our own freedom? After all, so far as I know, none of us are running around committing any mass shootings. Well, here's the advice that Paul gave to members of the early Christian community in Rome over the much more mundane matter of eating meat. This is what Paul said. He said, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, then you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. So even though Paul had absolutely no issues with the eating of meat, because it had a deleterious effect on the faith lives of others, he suggested that, out of love, Christians should happily surrender that right. In the face of 19,380 gun murders, 22,500 gun suicides, and 39,427 gun injuries in 2020 alone, numbers unparalleled by any other industrialized nation. It's clear that our limitless right to access guns is destroying far more people for whom Christ died than me eating meat ever did. As such, restricting our own right to own guns for the good of others is possibly the most Christian thing we can do. Faith and doubt. 
It's a story as old as, well, the church anyway. My faith used to be such an important part of my life, but the church just doesn't seem to work for me the same way, and I don't know why. This is such a moving and current question for us as a postmodern people and for us as a postmodern church. The phenomenon of shrinking and wrinkling faith communities is so widespread that the religiously unaffiliated nun has become the third largest religious identity in the world. In his new book, Faith After Doubt, Brian McLaren proposes that doubt is actually an act of faith, an act that is natural and innate to the journey of building and growing a healthy, integrated, and mature spiritual life. You see, doubt is the source, the energy, the inspiration that propels us to move out of ways of being and thinking that no longer work for us. Doubt pushes us from a simple right versus wrong belief system through a pragmatic complexity that uses faith to achieve something like status or access to heaven to a questioning perplexity that challenges the status quo and sees faith as an obstacle. Ultimately, doubt drives us to the kind of faith and a relationship with the holy and with all of God's creation that McLaren describes as holistic harmony, where all of our former faith experience is integrated and we get comfortable with mystery and unknowing. This inclusive way of faithing seeks the common good and we become interdependent, more connected to the whole of creation, more humble, reverent, and focused on being of service. So here's the thing, this natural process of faith formation after doubt needs a faith community that will nurture and develop that kind of transformation. But most of our religious bodies are designed to do the opposite. So when you're struggling with doubt and not sure you're inspired enough to come to church, maybe you're not the problem because Jesus certainly didn't care. After his resurrection, the 11 disciples went to the Galilean mountain where Jesus had told them to go. They saw him and they worshiped him. But Matthew tells us that some doubted. These guys had spent three years with Jesus and they had seen for themselves every miracle, every healing and every faithful act of Jesus's love and still they doubted. But Jesus comes near, does not chastise or criticize. He just sends them with the great commission to go out to the ends of the earth and make disciples, baptize them and teach them the things that Jesus taught. So I suppose if they can doubt and change the world, so can we. So Christian nationalism, it seems like complicated, right? But actually, if you look uh, in Mark chapter nine, uh, under the very apropos subheading, another exorcist, um, the disciples come to Jesus and say, Rabbi, somebody is casting out devils in your name. Uh, what should we do? And Jesus's reply is basically like, well, you know, if he ain't against us, he's for us. In other words, it's a big tent, brother. Come on in. Right? So actually, we all know that throughout history, Christians have been responsible for unspeakable acts. During the period of European colonial expansion, for example, they unleashed the slave trade, they eradicated entire civilizations, all while claiming to be Christians. In more recent news, when uh, the Capitol was stormed, whose banners did they gather underneath? Well, Donald Trump's and Jesus Christ. So it's a big tent. Actually, though, to be fair, in the story from Mark, after Jesus says, if you ain't against us, you're for us, he goes on to say, anyone who gives you a cup of water because you bear the name Christ of Christ will by no means lose their reward. So in other words, Jesus is preaching pretty common sense. He's saying, 
Was this guy helping people? Then he's with me. In other words, alongside the atrocities of history, I would submit that we should consider the diggers, a group of English farmers who, to protest the rising cost of food, decided to occupy a plot of unused land, cultivate it, and grow food for their community. Land held in common for the good of all. John, these men are communists. But actually, you'd be wrong. Because this isn't 1917 or 1968, and nobody is singing the Internationale because this is a revolution inspired by the gospel. To do as Jesus taught, hold property in kind as the early Christians had done for the good of all. In other words, maybe we should judge our Christian nations as you would a Christian neighbor. Do they make it difficult for their citizens of color to live their lives? Do they stand idly by while people die of privation? Or do they offer a cup of water to somebody who is thirsty? So on the one hand, the basic function of the military is to eradicate its enemies. On the other hand, Jesus taught us that we should love our enemies. On the other, other hand, in the New Testament, Jesus encounters four different men who served in the Roman army, and he asked none of them, none of them to leave their position. In fact, he exclaimed that one of them had more faith than anyone else in all of Israel. Uh, so how does all that <laughs> square together exactly? So yes, it's true that the ultimate vision of the Christian faith is that it will be on earth as it is in heaven, as we like to say in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but that is not yet the world in which we live, is it? The world in which we currently live is a broken one, and there are actors in it that will seek wealth and power no matter the human cost. And in light of that reality, there is a pragmatic need for militaries and military intervention because prayer vigils and good vibes are not gonna stop killing. Which is all to say that, that from a biblical, theological, and practical perspective, if a Christian's conscience permits them to use force and violence to ultimately protect innocent human life, then they should feel free to serve in the military. In the Hebrew scriptures, prophets were sent by God to rebuke rulers who disregarded God's call for justice. It has been said that the first step of prophecy is lament, crying out in the midst of suffering and injustice, because lament breaks through numbness and hopelessness. How dare you crush the faces of my people into dust, shouts the prophet Isaiah. The outcry of our present day prophets has broken through. I can't breathe. Thanks to the protestations of the movement for black lives, numbness has dissolved into resolve. And these prophets bring us hope because they know firsthand the problem. They have lived experience with a system that crushes them. They have outlined radical proposals that reimagine policing. They have called for an institution that protects instead of persecutes black people and communities of color. They are prophets calling for justice. So let us hear them out. Less than 40% of African-Americans trust police Anything other than a fundamental overhaul of the scope and the role of law enforcement brings to the mind the words of the prophet Jeremiah. They dress the wounds of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. 
Beloved, as Christians committed to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, let's not get caught up in a fragile white response talking about safety or who's going to show up when you call for help. Let's not divert our attention from the prophet's plea and argue about the prophet's semantics. Whether we call it defunding, abolition, or reallocating resources, a radical reformation, a radical reformation is needed if God's love and justice is to be made real. In city after city, the police budget is always one of the largest municipal expenditures, including here in Medford. And this has always been an investment in keeping black people down. It is time instead to use our tax dollars to uplift. When Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, there is no question that he is talking about investing your money on the things that will bring about love, mercy, and justice for all. So when the prophet cries, defund the police, perhaps we should heed their call, or at least listen and take a look at where our treasure is. So I have to admit, this question came to us in the form of what do you do when your church doesn't want you? And I just want to let that sink in for a minute. Um, I know so many gracious and vibrant folks, especially queer folks, for whom this question cuts so deep. And this one, I gotta say, this really, this broke me, you guys. <laughs> like, I can tell you about gradually shifting away from communities, right? Slowly learning that this isn't the place for me, these people don't give me life. And even when you are completely sure, when you are totally convicted that this is the right decision, it is so hard. In the gospel, Jesus tells his disciples that if you find a people who won't listen to you, if you find a place that doesn't want you around, shake the dust off your feet. Which is to say, sever all ties, because the soil of that land will defile you. But Christian fellowship gives our souls somewhere to rest. It lets us know that we are safe, that no matter how bad it gets, our community has our back with fierce and unconditional love. Every single one of us wants to feel safety, wants to feel support, wants to be seen, wants to be appreciated. But sometimes, Folks look to communities that seek to accomplish this safety and this support by promoting hate and destruction. I mean, just look at white nationalism, Christian nationalism. So for those people who are caught inside of that kind of Christian fellowship, we wish for you, dear ones, that you be able to shake the dust of the things that have hurt you off of your feet. Amen. Let every good and true Christian understand that wherever truth may be found, it belongs to the master. So those are the words of Augustine from all the way back in the year 400. And while Augustine was talking about the truth found in other religious traditions, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that this notion, this notion that, that all truth is God's truth, I want to suggest that this is the best way for Christians to think about the relationship between faith and science. 
don't get me wrong, we, we of course love our scriptures and we love to look to them for inspiration and insight into how to lead good lives in relationship with God. But when science opens our eyes to a truth that is not found in the Bible, be it evolution or quarks or the multiverse, we shouldn't experience that as faith having lost and science having won. Rather, we should experience that simply as our understanding of God's truth having increased. And our response, it should be one of awe and wonder. Awe and wonder that God's truth is wilder and more amazing than anything that the biblical authors in all of their wisdom could have ever possibly imagined. Amen, amen, amen. This has been a fun, albeit challenging opportunity for all three of us. And we are so grateful that so many of you took time to put us in the hot seat on these controversial topics. These are really big questions. And as we already noted, they deserve time and attention, study and reflection. So we wanna be sure that you know that these words we have offered are not the last word. And as John noted in the messy message, we are available to process, listen, talk, and pray with you about all of these things and all things. But we also wanted to affirm that there were several other juicy questions posed that we didn't tackle. And that decision was not simply a matter of having the time to talk about them. Some of these included anti-Semitism, death with dignity, the culture side of mission, birth control, virtue signaling, savior complexes, and poverty porn. Once we started to study and consider them, we concluded that to tackle some of these topics in a quick take would be irresponsible. One of those choices was the topic of mental health. Much like with sex, the church has either been deafeningly silent about mental health or the church has been a source of stigma and shame about mental wellness and neurodiversity. And in those choices, the church and society in general has marginalized many of God's beloved ones to suffer in silence. This is a topic we do not want to short shrift, especially as open and affirming congregations, because the church should be a, an open source of affirmation and inclusion, support and light, and radical revolutionary love for all, especially those who are suffering and or marginalized. We must continue to talk about controversial topics as real and valid struggles that we Christians face, even if we ourselves haven't experienced them. This hot seat quick take challenge has left us at a starting point, and we're committed to taking us on this journey with you. In all of these matters, we have to do better. We must take our place in the conversation. We must break the silence. We must educate ourselves, ask questions, and never dismiss someone else's experience. We must resist the temptation to give a neat answer to a messy problem. And we must act to enable equitable inclusion and social policy if we are to call ourselves followers of Jesus. This is how we love one another. This is how we build the kingdom, by listening to each other and by loving all of God's world in all of its diversity. May it be so for us here at Hillside and Sanctuary. Amen. Friends, we thank you so much for uh, trying this experiment with us. Uh, we move now to a time where we ask that you lift up your joys and concerns together. And then together, we will recite the words, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So if you'd like to raise your hand in person or digitally, we would love to hear your voice. Jared, so good to have you with us. As always, is John. <laughs> hey, I'm bringing but nothing but an expression of gratitude for the Lord oh. for answering my prayers recently. I mean, a dear friend of mine, who I consider or more than just a friend at this point, had a bit of a minor battle with a bit of laryngitis, lost voice. Mm. 
said my prayers across two nights worth and I got the glorious news yesterday that she was able to finally get it over and heal from it. So <laughs> expressing nothing but the finest of praises to our savior. If you're here today. Always wonderful to have friends to accompany you even when your voice is too scratchy. Lord, <laughs> in your mercy, hear our prayer. So let's see, let's see. Uh, Reverend Tom. Uh, I just want to lift up uh, one in the prayer box that Kate Eshelman shared that our beloved congregant Dorothy Bader uh, was in the hospital and she's apparently moving to rehab today, uh, which is very good news. Uh, so if you could hold Dorothy in your prayers, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Um, and I would actually, I would like to lift up a prayer uh, for the... <clears throat> For the uh, trade unionists and citizens who are protesting right now in uh, Bogota, their government is currently uh, trying to enact policies to uh, levy a 20% increase uh, on their retail taxes for food um, in a country that is already uh, struggling a lot. Uh, in, in particular, I want to lift up prayers for my friend Laura, who is out there right now with the protesters. Um, so yeah, that she may be safe, that all may be safe protesting in Colombia today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uh, John, one from the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's neighbor is a Christian scientist who is right now trying to find the right path between uh, doctors treating her cancer uh, and her faith, which relies on prayer uh, for all forms of healing. Uh, so for that, real struggle of faith and conscience. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. John, I'd like to lift up a travel, prayer for traveling mercies for you leaving today for California and for the joy of being back with family um, and for your mom who's going to receive you today. Uh, and for Bailey, who is in Washington this next couple of weeks. So for traveling mercies and, uh, and joy of family, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Any other joys and concerns from the congregation today? You guys are, you guys are awfully quiet. Uh, Jess wants to share gratitude. Uh, oh, her procedure went well. She let some of us know that earlier and we are so grateful for that. So yeah, uh, gratitude from Jess for the prayers, but also gratitude from us that your procedure went well, Jess. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I'm not gonna penalize anybody for feeling quiet. And gratitude for getting to play outside with her string quartet today. Oh, from Joanna. That's wonderful news. I'm so grateful you got to do that too. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Actually, yes. I want to... Go um, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to lift up uh, prayers uh, for those who are living through a really difficult moment in uh, India in this moment. Mm. Um, that at the end of Jess's prayer, uh, she had written prayer that the distribution efforts continue for the COVID vaccine. Um, and it just brought it to top of mind as it might've been for, um, for so many of you. Uh, so Lord, mm -hmm. in your mercy, hear, hear our, prayer. our prayer. I actually um, wanna also lift up a prayer um, for all entertainers and musicians as they have continued to try to build their craft in this new world. Uh, and especially today, a prayer uh, for Alex Olapade, who is, has a, is on his way to Miami to participate in a television show where he's bringing some of his actual real live music. Uh, so for that celebration, um, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All right, my friends, if you will join with me. Wait, Sarah. Oh, 
Sarah, please. Sorry. No, no. Here. Um, <clears throat> today is International Bereaved Mother's Day. Um, as you know, Mother's Day is next week. Um, and uh, this Sunday before uh, Mother's Day is International Bereaved Mother's Day. Um, and right now I am thinking of all of the mothers um, of our black and brown brothers and sisters who have um, lost their lives just in this year alone. Um, so a prayer for bereaved mothers everywhere. And you. Sarah, for you included. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh, friends, if you will be with me in the spirit of prayer. God, we are so grateful to you for allowing us to gather together. We are so grateful for a community that will hold us as we have difficult conversations. Without love, it is so, so hard to confront the evil of the world, to confront things that confound us. We are so grateful, so grateful that there are folks who are ready to stick it out with us. And as I leave this community for two weeks, I do just wanna say a special, uh, See you later. <laughs> uh, it has been an utter blessing to be with you these last few months. Um, In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Beloved, as our service comes to an end, I remembered uh, that I made a promise to Jeff Smith to lift in prayer his other faith community, Zion Church uh, in Everett, which um, had an experience uh, of a hate crime directed at them this week. And so I just want to lift that up and recognize that even as we uh, take the care that we're taking, um, there there is hate being expressed towards um, black and brown people in ways that are are really harmful so lord in your mercy we hold that community hear our prayers and so beloved may god bless you and keep you may god's face shine upon you and be gracious to you may god look upon you with kindness and grant you peace 
go out from here and listen and learn and talk and grow. Amen. <laughs>